since that relationship being crucial this week, today we'll look at a few icons of Christ himself, his person, which are different in the sense that one of them, particularly the, uh, well, the Pentecost, or it can change, but at any rate, you see Jesus on his own. So, outside of relationships, per se, looking at him. And then we'll look at three icons in particular of um, Jesus' life, where we see Jesus in relationship not only to his mother or other people, but in fact all of creation. And that magnifies not only what's going on in the icon then, but also the panorama of significance that the incarnation has for not simply Mary, they'll call him St. John the Forerunner, John the Baptist, but also for all the creatures of the world, all of us, and so on and so forth. So before we start looking, we'll just recap a little bit. Um, when we think about the image of the Son of God, you can think of Colossians, where Jesus is referred to as the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. You'll recall in the Eucharistic prayer that we uh, say at the moment, Call Jesus the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. And so that has even there little foreshadowings of the one who is the firstborn of all creation having a profound impact on all of creation. And there's a thought that as we come to look at icons of Christ, that Christ is renewing the human image that was marred in some fashion by the fall, by sin. And so Jesus becomes not only the perfect revelation of God in the world, but also the realization of what the perfect human is. Jesus takes all of humanity and redeems it. And theologically, and when we think about church doctrine, we might think then of the icon of Christ as being an expression of what one of the early councils of the church, the Council of Chalcedon in 451, what they determined, they all affirmed in their confession that Jesus was of one substance with God and also of one substance with us, with humanity. So all of this is in the background as we come to look at these icons of Christ himself. You'll recall perhaps from an earlier session that we talked about the unpainted originals. And on your handout, you'll see this word coming back again, the aetheropoietos, which is without human hand. It's an adjective, so to say that the icon was made without human hands. Um, and this was one of the images that we looked at, the Mandelion, which also can be known as that name, which is referring to uh, the icon of the Lord on the cloth, because if you recall, the legend that came up in the 5th century was to say that in the Byzantine version, that this, this icon was made and was in fact an impression of Jesus' face on a piece of linen that Christ pressed his face to and then sent to a king named Abgar, who is the king of Edessa. And so this is known as the holy face of Edessa, um, of San Silvestro, which is the church in Rome where it was kept until 1870, and now it's in the Matilda Chapel in the Vatican Palace. But at any rate, this, this adjective of Akerapoyatos refers to Mark 14:58. If you recall, um, Jesus said at one point, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. So that's where that word, not made with hands, is coming from what they're thinking of. And so this would have been considered a document of sorts um, that was a testimony of the incarnation of the world. And when we look at it as an icon, we find this. 
So this would be the Savior, here of Poyotas, the Holy Face. It's from the 20th century, so it's a little later on. Well, it's comparatively later on. But at any rate, you see just the face of Jesus. Neither the neck nor the shoulders are included, and he's framed by this long hair that falls in locks on either side. And we notice that um, the line of the mouth, it's not particularly carnal, per se. It doesn't have a huge amount of sort of the fleshiness with it. And then John Marsh, I think, noted last week the line that the eyebrows and the long nose create, which iconographers will, will note the, the shape almost of a palm tree in that. And so in the expression, there's a sort of impassivity that we see that is at the same time not one of disinterest. It is the impassivity of an absolutely pure human nature which excludes sin but remains open to all the sorrows of the fallen world. And we see Jesus' eyes turned towards the onlooker. He's attentive and yet saddened in a fashion. And the look is penetrating, but it's not overwhelming altogether. And this um, <coughs> halo, as we would think of it, is called the nimbus, which has the initials of the name of God. And the name that they use is the one used in Exodus 3.14 when Moses says to God, who shall I say is sending me? What's, what is your name? And God says, I am who I am. So this, in Greek, the, the omicron on the top is the word for the, the, and then this is a long O, and this is an N of sorts, it's a capital new in Greek. So it's the BA, Ha'on. That's the name that is used for God. And you'll see also, Jesus' face is obscuring it, but it's, the nimbus is also marked by a cross. And so, what you also curiously find is up here are also the initials of Christ. It's what we would sort of think of in our alphabet as an I and a C, and an X and a C. And so the initials for Jesus, they'd be in the Greek. So in Greek, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christos. And so the initials would be the first and the last character of the name. So we have an iota and a sigma, an I and an S for Jesus, and then a chi for Christos that ends with an S. So you have what equates to JS and then CHS. And those initials, they are obligatory for inscriptions that, that need to appear on icons of Christ, on icons of the Mother of God, and also on the icons of saints. And if you recall, on that same principle last week when we were looking at images of Mary, the initials for Mary's name, they're Meter, so you have the M and the R, the Mu, and then the Rho, which looks like a P. And then you have Theu, which is of God. So you'd have the Theta, and you'd have the Upsilon. So you'd have four letters each time. So here it's Jesus Christ, and on icons of Mary, it's the initials that say Mother of God. So this is the Holy Face. And the second one that we'll look at this is Christ the Roman, the Pantocrator. And Pantocrator, so Panta meaning everything, and Krator is to rule. So it's Christ who is the ruler of all. And here you've got so much more to see than just a face. You have Jesus seated, you can see amongst all these colors, seated on this throne. You can see all of him, the king of glory, who's surrounded by heavenly powers. And so you'll see again, this may remind you all of the uh, Padigatria, where 
Jesus was sitting in his mother's arm and he had the hand of blessing and then the hand that was holding either the scroll. Here it's a gospel book. And open in the gospel page resting on his knee is a composite text of John 7.24 and Matthew 7 verse 2. So if we think Christ is the one who rules everything, the composite quotation that one would read here says, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. For with what judgment, and these words aren't included on here, but it continues, with the judgment that you judge, so you will also be judged. So that's what's being evoked on the gospel pages in this icon. You recall, so this is the mandorla again, that window into heaven that encircles Jesus. And there is also, there are two curved squares, one out here and one inside, and they form an octagonal star, which symbolizes uh, a future eon <coughs> to come. And that's visible in other icons that we may look at as we continue in this course. So the first square most immediately embraces Christ, the Pantocrator, and He's enclosed in this mandorla by, you can see them faintly, these faces of cherubim that are all around him. So that he is seated in the midst of the heavenly powers and they represent the whole world of the angels that surround the throne of God. And then in the corners of the second square here, these are as we've alluded to before, the symbols of the evangelists who proclaim the gospel to the four ends of the earth. So we have the human, a man, which is Matthew. We have the eagle, which is John. And down here we have a lion, which is Luke. And we have Mark as the bull. I got that right. No. Mark is the, li Mark is the lion down here. So you have this strong, calm movement of Jesus that at the same time is put up against the fluttering of the angels round about him and that soaring movement of the evangelists proclaiming the gospel out to the ends of the world. And I should say that the evangelists, they're depicted that way. Again, Matthew in the top over there is the man, John is the eagle, Mark is the lion and Luke as the bull because of the verses that come in Revelation in chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, which says, Around the throne and on each side of the throne are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face like a human face, and the fourth living creature like a flying eagle. So that is where they they draw the imagery for the four gospel writers. And if you look at a further image, whoops, there we go. So this is the same same type of icon, but only looking at the top half of Jesus we get a, a different sort of perspective. He's not in that context of the heavenly realm and the octagonal star that symbolizes the future eon here. He is in a dark blue hemation, which is this Greek garment. It's not necessarily a priestly garment of any kind. But he does have a gold tunic on underneath, which is resplendent, and it's a sort of glorious vestment. And he is holding again a gospel book, and you have that hand of blessing, the right hand, gesturing in benediction towards the gospel book. And that has the familiar passage from Matthew 11, it's 28 and 30, Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest, for my yoke is easy. And in this case, that nimbus with the initials of the cross has been effaced. So it's a different perspective on the same type of icon and yet a comparatively different experience of looking at it. 
And this is the final one we'll look at of the Pantocrator. This one is covered with an enamel frame, and the Gospels open to those same words from Matthew, Come unto me, all you that labor. And it's a simplified representation of Christ. The tunic that we see underneath, it's got that same dark on, but the tunic underneath is not of gold. It's comparatively more modest. Christ here is less majestic in his appearance. And it seems that the iconographer, especially in the face, has sought to emphasize more of a sweetness and more of the nature of compassion of Christ, who is accessible to all of humanity in their prayers. And it's interesting to note, this is from the latter half of the 19th century, which is a period of particular decadence. So the fact that this icon remains faithful in its conception and its technique to the type of Christ the Pantocrator within the iconographic canon and the simplicity the simplicity of it is marked in the sense that so much of what was being produced at that time would have been comparatively more ornate and beautiful. So do we have any questions or thoughts at all as we go? We'll, we'll turn next to look at some icons from the life of Christ. I wonder if at this point... Just generally, do you know where these are located now? They are, some of them are housed in private collections. And some of them are in different museums, so they've, they've been dispersed. Um, as I say, that first gilded face of Christ, that's in the Vatican. So some of them are housed in churches now, Other, others moved around and are now in other private museums. But the ones in what you're showing, mm -hmm. what you're showing are all out of their original Russian. Yep, I think most of them would have. They moved around and they've either settled in a church or they but most of them have been displaced right. from their original right. context in which right. they were created. Yeah. Any other thoughts of looking at these faces, images of Jesus compared to what we saw of Mary? So we've moved from the infant who occasionally looked older older than a baby last week when he was seated with Mary to this Jesus here. But bringing both of them together, perhaps, we can look at this icon, which is an icon of the nativity. And there is a, a wealth of, of information here, which is sort of staggering, and which is why also we'll, we'll look at fewer images today than we did last week, just because of the richness that there is in what we can see. So there is, at the very center, in a prominent position, Jesus as the infant, in his swaddling clothes, in a manger, in this dark cage. And with that as its center, we can see so clearly depicted here that in the iconographer's mind are the sheer extent of the ramifications of this event, of the Incarnation truly occurring for all of these, all of these people. At the top here as well, this circle, this portion of a circle, is indicative of heaven. So it, it points us almost outward of the icon's own sort of sway. It reaches up to gesture to not only the earthly ramifications of the Incarnation, but also throughout the heavens, throughout time and space. It's not just a festival of creation, but of recreation that sanctifies the whole world. And you may recall, last week we looked at one icon, um, the icon of the sign of Mary, where she was seated and Jesus was sort of in front of her hair, her hands were both out praying, and she was encircled with a very dark blue uh, coloring on the inside of the mandorla that signified sin and this inbreaking of light. And that's the same thing that's going on here. 
with the darkness of the cave and the brightness of Jesus' own clothing, the swaddling clothes, the white shining out. And so, looking at Jesus here, well, you can almost, you can barely see his face. There's a, a totally different sort of intention going on that situates Christ here taking up so little space in the icon and in doing so emphasizing his abasement, his humanity, you might say his vulnerability in being born and interestingly also in a way that foreshadows his death and his resurrection because we have the darkness of the cave, what we would think of as um, the stable, the darkness of the cave that foreshadows the darkness of the tomb, and the brightness of these white swaddling clothes that foreshadows the material that Jesus will be wrapped in and that will be left there in the tomb after he's risen. So there's so much in view in this icon not only in terms of this circle at the top which points us in toward heaven but also in terms of Jesus' whole life being in view. The ox and the donkey to account for the other characters that are here. The ox and the donkey, they're not referred to in any of the Gospels. But they're thought of as fulfilling the prophecy that's in Isaiah 1 and 3 which says the ox knows its owner and the donkey its master's crib but Israel does not know my people do not understand. So, there you have a scriptural understanding of their presence in this scene, even though it's not linked to, for example, the infancy and the birth narrative in Luke, for example. And Mary is singled out in a very prominent way. What do you think of Mary's position here? What she's doing? What do you make of it? Any thoughts? They're all welcome. She doesn't look very lively. She doesn't look very lively. She's hugely sick. Why do you think she might not look very lively at this point? <laughs> exactly. So there were other there are other versions of this icon where they had Mary half sitting up. And there was a great there was a great debate then because people in the church thought no, 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 you have to have Mary lying down because otherwise no one will believe that Jesus really was truly human because what mother would give birth and then, you know, not be having a good period of rest after that event. Any other thoughts? She's lying down. And she's dark. Why? She's dark? Almost as dark as the cave. She's looking. Yeah. She is. She's looking at something too. So, so you'll notice she's almost like twice the size of almost any other yeah. you know, fully grown adult in this icon. So clearly her, her role, especially as she, you know, she curves right around this same line of Jesus' own crib. She's made very, very prominent. You cannot miss her. Can I fail to know who she is? She's looking, as it turns out, this is Joseph. And Joseph has been completely segregated from this group. Any thoughts on why? What kind of interpretation that might be about Joseph's? What's he doing? <laughs> Strangely enough. So he is being, he's being tempted by the devil. This is the devil in the guise of an older, bent shepherd. And again, there's this saturation of theological sort of arguing going on in here. Because just as we had that question with Mary, what posture is she in? And what does that say about whether Jesus is human or not? There was thought that Joseph was beset by doubt about whether the Incarnation really was possible. And this icon seems to depict that that's just magnified 
by this sort of isolation that he experiences because he's not Jesus's father, his actual father. And so he's displaced out of this nativity scene. He still has the halo. He still has the halo though, so he's still a saint. And, and Mary, of course, it's the only thing, but Mary is looking at Joseph, not looking at Jesus, but looking at Joseph with compassion. So there's a teaching in this icon that stresses tolerance inclusion. and inclusion and compassion for human doubt and for unbelief. So it not only depicts this very specific, unique situation that Joseph finds himself in, but one that on any given day, Christians and non-Christians alike may find themselves in the position of how one truly believes in something for which there is no reason per se or explanation for. Otherwise, this interestingly enough is another apocryphal picture that comes from two gospel accounts that never made it into the canon. They're called Pseudo-Matthew and Pseudo-James. There, um, these are two midwives that Joseph is said to have brought to Mary, and they are they're bathing Jesus. Oh. Here, so he occurs there as well. And again, the notion is this emphasis on Jesus really having been fully human, and so having had and been subject to the same natural requirements that are the case with all human nature. And up here we have, we have angels either side. We have these two giving glory to God. And then we have this one who's bringing tidings to humanity. So you've got this vertical stretch of an icon that we can almost imagine that if we pulled out we'd see so much more of what's going on here. So these are the wise men that are coming, and this is a shepherd. This is the boy. Yes, so they usually have, in other icons you'll have more than one shepherd, but it's, they usually have an instrument of some kind that is referring to the song, you know, so David was a shepherd, David sang all of these songs, so there's musical aspects what the shepherds are doing is there. And this, strangely, this is um this is the star. It's very faint. But that's the star that shines down on this darker cave that orients the wise men to follow it and to find it. So it's a rather, it's a, it's a shockingly rich <laughs> depiction of what's going on in that moment where God becomes human. There's a lot to take in. Any other, any thoughts? Any? You have a combination of biblically attested to images and then these sort of ripples that were in the church that give us then these pictures of the midwives of Joseph being tempted by the devil to say, no, 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 this is not really what you think it is, what you've been told. So we move from that to a somewhat simpler in the sense that it has fewer protagonists. This is an icon of the baptism of Jesus, which is appropriate for today since we'll be having baptisms as we're celebrating All Saints Day. So this is from the 16th century, earlier on. And this may look familiar. So this is that circle again that is evoking the heavens. So in the baptismal account, you'll recall the heavens break open and the dove descends. So that's all accounted for there. The dove has been ever so slightly effaced 
in this icon, so you can't see it quite as well. But there's the ray of light, the Holy Spirit descending. And we have Jesus, and this is very, you see, so he's, he's entirely naked here. And you'll have to just take my word for it, because it's barely visible, but this hand that he has down is in that same right-handed gesture of blessing. So even as Jesus himself is being baptized by, as the iconographers call him, by John the Forerunner, who has his right hand on Jesus, Jesus himself is blessing the waters of Jordan that cover him. And Jesus sanctifies these waters of Jordan in his own immersion as he is baptized. He is not clothed at all. He is the one who strips his own body to clothe the nakedness of Adam. So again, you'll see there are all these resonances of the recreation of humanity, Jesus becoming this perfect human in a way that had been that had been compromised. John, you'll notice, and again, it's a little hard to see, but John's right hand is on Jesus' head. John's left hand is in this gesture of prayer, the same as we've seen of Mary, and as we've seen of Jesus. And the angels are present. And since their role is not specified in Scripture, they're simply... They're simply there. They're not doing anything specific, but they are witnessing, and their robes are covering their hands in a gesture of reverence that you may recall Father Bill talked about earlier in the course. But even the positioning of John and also of the angels all reinforces these lines that bent toward Jesus and his person in the center. And I cannot but think that it's not a mandorla. It's not that window into heaven. And yet it looks somewhat similar to that oval shape in which Jesus is often enclosed. So we go from the nativity and one can understand, because if, if the whole nature of producing icons of Christ is embedded in the idea that the Incarnation is this singular and incredible event, then it makes sense that the Nativity icon of Christ would be incredibly multifaceted and have all kinds of layers. And at this moment, when Christ has taken flesh, we've got a smaller cast of characters all pointing towards this moment, where the line is very much between heaven and earth, very much between the Spirit of God descending and God incarnate receiving that Spirit. So you could think for a, a good while about what this might say about Jesus' baptism, what it says about our own baptisms, what is happening when we have babies and um, adults this morning who go into the font and who are immersed in this water and their connection between the earth here and heaven and the spirit that is descending. It's quite remarkable. And at the same time, descending into the water that for Jesus is not only a life-giving act, but it's the death to life. It's the going into the water to be raised up out of it again. And so, even as we see in the nativity, that that dark cave and the white swaddling clothes, they foreshadow the death of Christ, the darkness of the tomb, the clothes that will wrap him up after he's died, before he's risen, so this also has a sense of Jesus' death to come. It's, it's taking into account everything. And so lastly we look 
briefly at this icon of the crucifixion. It's noteworthy that in each of these, whether it's Jesus as the tiny infant, or going into the water without any clothes on, or here where he has only a loincloth on, the vulnerability is clear and pronounced and depicted in a variety of different ways. The flexion they'll call it, of the body to the right, and the bowed head, and the closed eyes. Those are all indications of the death of the crucified. And the Byzantine tradition is what ushers out of it this sober, simple depiction of this crucifixion scene. because as in the case of the Nativity, there are a number of people who could be included. Presumably, if you think about it, there were more than just these four onlookers when Christ died, and yet they're not included here. There's the simplicity of this tableau. So we have Mary, and we have St. John, and we have a holy woman, and the centurion, who says, truly, this was the Son of God. And just in that same angle, almost, as Mary's face was turned toward Joseph, so here Jesus' face, though bowed and eyes closed, is turned toward Mary. And there's this fascinating sort of direction of vision, because in this triangle, you have Jesus face directing one's gaze towards Mary, and then you have Mary, though. Who, who's, who does she seem to be looking at? She seems to be looking at Jesus? Somewhere else. Yes, straight across. She's looking at John. And she has, she's grasping her garment with one hand, and she's gesturing in her other hand as if to invite John who's clutching his face, who's almost in a comparatively more pain situation than the sort of serenity on Mary's face, even in grief, seems to convey. And so Mary gestures to John to behold with her, if you like, the mystery of salvation that's affected in the death of her son. While we have the holy woman, who is herself in an action of lament, and we have the centurion, who's beholding Christ, and in the icon, he has his right hand in a position that almost anticipates him making the sign of the cross. The centurion who professes belief. So much happening in a silent moment, otherwise. And interestingly enough, down here, you see again, there's this dark cape, there's this dark space with this bright, in this case, a skull. And I'll give you, you've been mentioned here already, who do you think the skull might be of? The old human, it's Adam, is thought to be Adam's skull. Because St. John Chrysostom, he would say that by some people, Adam was thought to have been buried at Golgotha because it was the place of the skull. And so it's a depiction almost of this theological assurance, since by man came death, so in Christ shall all be made alive. is a victory over death then, and a victory over hell, that's symbolized by this, this rent, renting of the rock that happens at the moment of Jesus' death, that the earth shook and the veil was torn. So there is the death of death, 
per se. What's going on around his feet? Is that a lectern that he's standing on? This is so this cross, it has eight extremities. So it's got this bar, this bar, this it's called a supadeneum. It's a step so that Jesus' feet would have rested on. This would have been, it's not on this icon, but this would have been where that king of the Jews exactly would have been <coughs> shown. So this is the, you'll see then on certain crucifixes, even the you know, people wear around their necks, you'll have these extra bars that are there. But from the perspective, that matches the perspective of the altar behind. Mm -hmm. And so those are, these are the walls of Jerusalem. Those are the brown things with white marks on These are the rent rocks. So it's as if this is the earth and the earth has been broken up oh, okay. at this moment of death to reveal the death, the, as we've seen other icons, right, the sort of sinfulness that the darkness evokes, that even as Christ dies, Christ is triumphing over, literally. wrap up, but at any rate, the fact that Jesus is crucified outside of Jerusalem for the iconographer is not only a historical truth, but it's also a spiritual precept to Christians that we are called to follow Jesus outside of the walls. And this is a reference to Hebrews 13 that says, we have no continuing city, but we seek a city to come. So even here, there is a leaving of the earthly city, and there is a, a notion of that heavenly city that's talked about in Revelation that is yet, that we have all yet to arrive at, and that Jesus welcomes us into. So that is a small slice of icons of Christ, and moments of Christ's life, which are Profoundly rich, we could we could look at them for a good while longer. But thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.